Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Douglas Whitfield joins me. We're going to be going to the library. No, we're going to be talking about how libraries manage those millions of things. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E. FLY dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Douglas Whitfield. Episode 396, recorded July 12, 2016. Koha ILS. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Drobo, a family of safe and expandable, yet simple to use, storage arrays. Drobos are designed to protect your important data forever. Visit drobo.com and use the code TWIT100 to save $100 off select Drobos, including the new B810i. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, libre, open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects, the little projects, projects you may be using every day and not aware of it, projects you may want to download and play with, projects that may do a lot of infrastructure stuff for you, but you're not even aware of doing it for that. I think that's today's show. I had to have a category for it. Um, joining me this week uh, is another brand new co-host. Uh, I'd like to welcome Douglas Whitfield to the show. Welcome, Douglas. Thank you, Randall. Good to be here. Uh, and I'll let you uh, introduce yourself since uh, it's all sorts of things. So, <laughs> Yeah. Um... I guess the uh, the short thing is I do a podcast in the lower third, um, musicmanument.com. It's all about um, Creative Commons music, specifically stuff that's allowed for remix. We do a bit of music technology, so there's been a few um, a few guest overlaps. We've had AV Linux on, uh, Ubuntu Studio, people like that. Uh, I also work for a uh, Creative Commons record label. Not really the first, but the first that's doing um, it the way we do it, um, blocksonic.com. I know, like... Back in November, I think you guys had on CC Mixter, or maybe that was November two years ago. It was November, <laughs> I remember, because they were doing a campaign in November. So, um, cool. Yeah, so I'm. I think even though I have a master's degree that's uh, a, you know accredited by the American Library Association, I like to think of myself as a uh, jack of all trades, master of none. So, <laughs> well, it's particularly appropriate given today's topic. Then, so yeah. today we have on uh, Koha Community Koha the ILS. I, ILS, yeah. What's ILS stand for? Integrated library system in this particular scenario. Right, right. Sometimes I, I, I know, other I'm, things. I, I'm a pilot, so I know what ILS means to pilots. Ah. It's something quite, quite different. We have a couple of people who are going to represent the project. We have uh, Brendan Gallagher and we have Nicole Enghart, and they will be coming on uh, shortly. Uh, so do you know anything about Koha? A little bit. I mean, sort of, I guess, their biggest... Infamy, I don't know, claim to fame as far as the global news is they had a big trademark fight a few years ago. So I think um, that was how a lot of people were introduced to them, you know, like what's going on. You know, people are taking open source trademarks. And uh, I think a lot of community members, you know, open source community members, that sort of scared a lot of people. So there was a big um, rally and cry around Koha. Um, so um, that that's sort of like the thing that I know the most about them. I've never used the uh, the application in a library setting personally, though. So I'll be learning along with everybody else. Cool. And we had um, we had the Evergreen Library System on yeah. about three years ago. Uh, that was episode 132. If you want to go check that out. So part of what I want to ask today is how does this compare with that? I watched the first two thirds of the Evergreen show uh, just this morning in prepping for this show. So that'll be really cool. Um, let's see. Oh, you you'll, you might want to spell the name of your uh, podcast because oh yeah, you know, because a lot of people are listening on audio and they won't be able to get that's it. That's true. That's a, that's a good point. So uh, music probably people can do that. So manumit is M A N U M I T, and it's the same root word as uh, manumission. So if people think about you know like the Emancipation Proclamation, that's the same the same root word. And so it's all it's all about music freedom. And, Okay, cool. I, I never went to enough school to learn any of all that. But before we bring our guests on, because uh, uh, then we can actually ask them what, what was, we were asking each other, uh, I do have a very important message. 
because digital data is essential to your life and your business. Drobo is the safe, simple, and expandable solution for all of your storage needs. Drobo offers a family of external storage arrays. We've talked about Drobos for home servers, photography, and video before, but this week we'll want to talk about the new Drobo for the small business office and the enterprise. Drobo has added to the high end of its product line, introducing the Drobo B810i. It's an 8-bay iSCSI SAN with data-aware tiering that offers full storage capabilities usually found in more expensive enterprise solutions. Data-aware tiering means that it automatically tiers frequently used transactional data from stored data that's seldom used. This enables businesses to consolidate storage resources and share that storage across all connected clients and their applications. You can access physical and virtual storage in a single array with the on-demand ability to scale for both capacity and performance as needed. Smart volumes allow you to create 255 individual drives with a maximum capacity of 64 terabytes each, provisioning as necessary. No more guessing how, much to, how big to make each volume. Dual iSCSI ports for up to two times, 2x gigabit Ethernet performance when you use MPIO in a Microsoft environment. Use it for collaboration, testing, development, backup, running Microsoft Exchange, or more. And it's perfect for the small or medium-sized businesses that don't yet have dedicated IT support. I personally have had a Drobo for about, I think, eight or nine years, ever since I heard about them, uh, sitting at home holding about uh, 16 terabytes of information that I can access remotely over the net, so it's very cool. Because Drobos are reliable. Data received by your Drobo has not, that is not yet written to disk is protected if there's a sudden power loss. Loss. Even better, Drobos have an internal eUSB device where data is copied if there's a power failure to protect against long outages. It's expandable. Add or replace your Drobo with ease. No tools required. Beyond RAID technology lets you expand on the fly and mix and match drives. I know when I went from one terabyte drive to uh, four terabyte drives, uh, all I had to do was pull them out one at a time, and it was a really simple process. Any, any person can do it. Uh, it's, it's also simple. The colored lights on the front of the Drobo communicate status. It's also fast. It supports iSCSI, Ethernet, and USB 3.0 connections. The connection varies per model. So visit Drobo.com to learn more about the Drobo B. 810i and to check out their complete line of products. Plus, when you use the code TWIT100, you'll save $100 off the purchase of a B810i or other selected Drobo models. That's Drobo.com and use the code TWIT100. We thank Drobo for their support of Floss Weekly. Now let's go ahead and bring our guest. Brendan, welcome to the show. Brendan? Good, good morning. Hi, hi. And where are you speaking to us from? I am in Portland, Oregon. Oh, yes, right, right, the guy that lives near, near me, but uh, I'm not there. I'm actually in Pasadena, California, uh, Captain Neal's house, so uh, okay. that's why it looks a little unfamiliar. Right, cool, cool. And let's also bring on uh, Nicole Ingard. Nicole, welcome to the show. Hello. And it's been so long since I've seen you. How did I bump into you uh, <laughs> recently? So we were just at the Texas Linux Fest here in Austin, where I live, um, and you stopped by the Tic Tac booth, and um, you were looking so lost that I had to come out and see what what it was you were looking for, and it just so happened you were looking for me. <laughs> indeed, indeed, yeah, and so I'm now safely out of that 100 degree temperature. Well, let's let's start with uh, Brendan. Uh, would you uh, please give us the overview? What is Coho, and what problem is it solved? Uh, sure. Uh, so Koha is a ILS, like you were talking about earlier, and uh, uh, Douglas definitely said that it's an integrated library system. Uh, so originally it started in 1999 uh, at the Horofinua uh, Library Trust in New Zealand. Uh, they had a system that had a Y2K uh, bug. Uh, so they went out to, to tender to try to find and choose a new system. And there was a local uh, development company that wanted to develop a system from the ground up for them. Um, and uh, both sides wanted to do it as an open source project. Uh, so originally it, it started in uh, September of 99 and it went live on January 2nd of 2000. And um, that's basically the beginning of it. I got involved in 2007. I was working for a library system uh, with uh, having a lot of difficulty having access to my data um, and just uh, I wasn't able to get to it. And I, I stumbled across this project and uh, fell in love with it. Cool, cool. So tell us more about what an ILS is. I mean, it, it, I, I'm guessing it's something used by libraries or large libraries, maybe chains of libraries to coordinate all the resources that are there and to tell you who's got what checked out and where things are loaned to. 
exactly. So on a very rudimentary <laughs> level, you could think of it as uh, an inventory system. Um, it, it's uh, most developers when they start to get into it, they would they would think of it as uh, you know it's just a, a glorified database. Um, except with librarians, um, there's some complex metadata formats that they use, and there's also a, a lot more uh, of uh, of how libraries manage and try to create access points to the data. So what it is, is um, there's kind of two sides to it. There's a front end side that users would use to search the collections and access uh, data, uh, both for physical collection management for the library, and then also digital uh, digital management of eBooks or um, audio files, et cetera. Uh, and then there's a backend staff side, which the librarians use, and they use it to classify uh, the data and to circulate it and be able to track it and uh, get their materials back uh, and then also order it and do uh, collection development. Cool. Uh, Nicole, let's uh, go to you for a bit. Uh, how did you get involved with the project? I was working at a, a law library a long time ago, um, and, and I worked as a web developer there. And so my job was writing software for the librarians to use um, within the library. And when uh, we had problems with the ILS we were using, they would come to me and ask me to try and fix the problems for them. And I always had to say no because it was a proprietary system. And so I started to do some research, as a librarian does, and found Koha. And you know, read all about the history, started talking to the people in the community, um, and brought it into my library and said, "Hey, you know, take a look at this. We should probably use this instead. Then I can actually help you, you know, maintain it and fix it and and make it what we need it to be." And um, the response was, "No, we're we're comfortable where we are." And mm -hmm. I basically said, "Well, I'm not." And so I started to look for ways that I could participate in the community until I got a paying gig working in the community. <laughs> okay. Hey, I just realized I was probably pronouncing it coho the entire time, for which I apologize. Uh, uh, I don't know. Coho is a kind of fish, and I was thinking, okay, what, what is coha? Is it an abbreviation? <laughs> Uh, no, it is not. So um, koha is the Maori word for gift, but it's a special kind of gift, a gift that comes with expectations. And so um, with koha, the expectation is that you will contribute back in some way. Um, so you can take this gift from the Hora Whenua Library Trust and you can use it in your library. And then um, they hope that you'll contribute back by either um, reporting issues, writing documentation, writing code, sharing with others so on and so forth. And so um, in New Zealand, when you enter museums, instead of having a donation box at the door, they have a koha box. Oh, that's pretty cool. It is kind of amazing. And this is just this wishes for either of you. So how how deployed do you think koha is? Is it is it like the number one open source ILS or or how would you characterize it? Uh, it's the it's the most downloaded uh, ILS library software in the world. Um, we don't have exact numbers, but I, I think it's somewhere over 15,000 uh, installs around the world. Wow, that's, uh, that's pretty extensive. Um, are they all talking to each other or would that only be if there's a need for like a regional library sharing? Some talk to so each other. For example, uh, in Turkey, uh, the whole nation of Turkey is using Koha. I think it's like 1,200 so libraries. Uh, but then there's also um, individual installs in Nigeria, um, in, in, all over India, um, in the U.S., all, all over the world. There's a lot of single installs, and then there's also group installs. Is this something then that uh, internationalization and localization would be pretty important to have in that? Absolutely. Definitely. And so... Oh. Um, we actually have um, a website, uh, translate.coha-community.org, where you can see the various different languages it's translated in. And then our quality assurance team is always looking at new features when they come in to make sure that they are going to, you know, handle special characters and be translatable as well. At what sense does this make sense to use uh, for, uh, like, my record collection at home? Is there a lot of setup and install that would be required, or is this something that's kind of a 
you can start simple and work your way up. There is a live CD out there or live DVD now, um, so it's pretty easy for you to install off of that. If you want to be participating in the code as well, um, you're going to need you know Git installed and your your usual setup, some sort of virtual machine. I've cataloged my collection um, in Koha, but um, I have been using Koha for um, ten or more years now, so um, <laughs> it wasn't hard for me. <laughs> Yeah, of course you, not. And and, uh, and and like Brandon, you're a you have a master's degree in library science, so this would probably be something that's right up your alley. It's it's definitely right up your alley. That's the the metadata format that librarians use. It's called MARC, um, and it stands for like machine access readable something or description. Um, and that's kind of very esoteric. So that part of cataloging or, 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 or classifying your own collection uh, would there's a little bit of a hurdle to get over that installing the software is quite easy uh, and uh, we have Debian packages now so that that uh, the installs is accessible it probably doesn't take a gamers machine either right it's probably just pretty straightforward exactly cool uh, I remember actually thinking back uh, 10 15 years ago I remember uh, the eyesight camera on the Mac when it was actually a separate little camera you plugged in on USB. Uh, I remember there was some program out there that I would hold up the UPC code of my DVDs and it categorized them on catalog them for me. Is, is that, is that part of the pathway to get data into this? Or can um, there are barcodes and, and, and you're thinking of like a barcode scanner. So you can yeah. definitely, um, you could definitely use cameras from computers. Um, and then librarians also have those barcode scanners, um, that, that they use. Um, mainly that is kind of more of like a keyboard input. Um, so there's not too much programming on, on the ILS side to be able mm -hmm. to handle that stuff. Now, is this? You said that you talked about you talked a little about the, the front end stuff. Like, is this like when people are actually checking books out? They're entering data immediately into the ILS. Yeah. So the front end is going to be um, the user side. Uh, you think of it as like the borrowers or the patrons, um, okay. and it's it's a like a, um, a search engine. Um, oh, okay. So currently, uh, we're we're Koha is using uh, a search engine called Zebra, d designed by Index Data. Um, and there is development to be used in Elasticsearch now. Um, and so basically it's, it's, it's the ability for you to be able to search and access, uh, material that you're looking for. Um, and then there's both, um, I think the next big step for libraries or library systems and, and for Koha is to, uh, navigate away from this old metadata format to, uh, link data and, uh, allowing, uh, other search engines from external sources to be able to harvest and uh, be able to display some of the, this metadata that libraries all over the world have and are sitting on that they really need to get out there. So I want to switch gears just a little bit, dig in just a little bit. We mentioned digital resource management earlier, which of course everybody knows about the other dig digital resource management, um, the DRM on music and things. And that is a big I guess, issue in libraries in general having to do electronic um, subscriptions and things, so electronic checkouts. Is that the, the DRM that, you know, people hate, is that something, I mean, libraries have to do it. So, I mean, it's a, it would be a good thing if there were some of those things in there just to deal with the restrictions that publishers put on. So is that something that, that Koha can deal with? We're we're definitely on the same page with you uh, that uh, we're not so sure um, about a DRM. We're not crazy about it either. Uh, from a library standpoint and from Koha, Koha, you know, a DRM is kind of oxymoron in my opinion to to have an open data. Uh, so Koha doesn't do much with um, the DRM management, if that makes sense. Right. Uh, mainly what we do is we rely on the publishers or any third party supplier of digital resources that they manage it. And then what we do is we just write connectors into the publishers so that we could authenticate the borrowers. Nice. Um, so a question, I guess, 
more for Nicole on uh, just because you mentioned the law library um, background. I, I was wondering if the whole trademark thing was something that, you know, if that was far enough back that you were involved, because I think that was longer than 10 years ago, but um, you said you had been using it for 10 years, and if maybe that's how you first got involved. No, um, actually, the trademark thing is still relatively recent in in all of our memories, um, and um, it's not how I got involved at all. I was definitely um, part of that in you know all the different interviews and spreading information, and we even created a, a little bibliography that we were sharing publicly on Zotero with you know the issues back and forth. So. Um, so, you know, I was definitely involved um, there, as was anybody active in the community, um, pushing for uh, Horafenua and the, the Koha community to get to retain that that trademark. Yeah, I may have gotten my, my dates mixed up because uh, <laughs> there's like a huge history for anybody who wants to, to go and dig into the history. It's like everything that has ever happened in the project. It's really amazing. Like I started to go through it all and then... I uh, I realized it was just too much. Uh, do either of you work on this uh, yes. this history? Or? Um, we all do. So um, is basically as we have something to add to the history, it's it's in Git, it's in the um, repository for Koha as well. So um, you know we go in and we add you know new developers and things like that. And um, at one point, I remember I went back and I was looking for uh, Kyle Hall, who's one of uh, the developers at Bywater who's been working on Koha longer than both of us, I believe, Brendan. Um, and yep. um, I, I realized he got skipped in the history. Um, and so I had to go all the way back and put Kyle in and then change, you know, the numbers for every other uh, developer on that list. So, um, mm. yes, we've, we've all worked on it from time to time. <laughs> right. Mainly all I've done with the history is just uh, push, push the new history. Um, I, I'm the release manager currently. Ah. So uh, another sort of changing gears question. We've talked a lot about libraries, and I think people have, um, you know, a conception of what a library is, certainly in the U.S. But I was wondering if you knew of any other sort of uh, non-traditional libraries, sort of archives of various sorts that might be using um, the software that, you know, probably people that aren't interested in libraries, we probably unfortunately lost um, some of them. But uh, maybe if they haven't gone yet, we can bring some of them back with this. <laughs> I'll let Nicole. Um... Um, yeah, we do have some some uh, special libraries with unique collections. Um, one of the ones I got to visit that was really neat was um, the Goodspeed Opera House. Um, uh, Brendan, remind me what state I was in when I was visiting there. <laughs> <laughs> Confused, <Connecticut>. apparently. <laughs> it was in Connecticut. I'm sorry. Connecticut. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a lot of libraries in New England, and so I, I sometimes forget all the places I visited. Um, and so they were, uh, they wanted to catalog, you know, pieces of scores and scores and, you know, tapes and um, notes from operas and things like that. And um, they didn't have any of this uh, organized yet. And I honestly, I mean, I left that training saying to them, please call me up and if you can ship me boxes of this stuff, I will catalog it for you. It was so exciting to like look through all this and really unique content. Um, and then there are other, we have museum libraries that use our services as well. Um, and so, um, yeah, there are definitely lots of different types of libraries using the software and unique ones. Awesome. We, we we did work with uh, uh, American, I, I can never say it correctly, Newsmatics. Maybe Nicole can correct that for me. It's a stamp library. Um, so they had collections of stamps um, and they had their own classification system. That, that was pretty cool. Nice. So you said you were the release manager, Brennan. Um, how often, you know, what's that job like? So we do major releases twice a year um, in May and November. Uh, and uh, being the release manager uh, is – so with Koha, we use Bugzilla. 
and uh, patches are submitted to Bugzilla, uh, and then we have to have uh, a sign-off uh, done, and then there's a QA team, and once the QA team passes it, then the final review is done by the release manager, and then that is pushed uh, to uh, the, the master branch. Um, and it's pretty active. A any month we have... Uh, probably 60 to 70 unique developers that are submitting code. Uh, for the project history, it's a little bit over 300 of them have been um, uh, submitted. Um, and I'm push per release, I think I've been pushing about 2,000 patches. Um, and that's anywhere from a couple lines to a couple hundred lines of code. How, how is this actually being managed in terms of what new features are going into the roadmap? Do you have uh, some sort of uh, foundation or executive committee or something that says uh, this is where we're going, this is what we're still missing? So there there isn't exactly a uh, executive committee. Um, what we do is we have a conference once a year. It's a user's conference, um, and we discuss a lot of these. We have a, a, a hack fest uh, where we talk about some plans for the future. Uh, we try to have a monthly meeting. Um, actually, there's two. There's a general IRC where um, it's sort of a majority vote on what sort of things the community is interested in and, and pushing forward with. And then we also have a developers meeting um, where we vote on things like uh, coding guidelines or um, any kind of uh, features. If um, anybody wants to submit uh, a new plan forward or new features, uh, they are asked to submit a uh, RFC to the wiki um, and any comments can happen there. Uh, and then we also ask that everyone creates a bug in Bugzilla first, um, and then any comments there um, and any alternative uh, ideas or plans would go there. And uh, what sort of, uh, I just had a question from the channel, uh, Esol asks, uh, did they mention the version control system? I don't think you have. Is it Git, I hope? It's Git. All right, roger that. Except it wasn't Git 10 years ago, probably. It was uh, uh, Savannah or uh, SourceForge. Uh, I forget. That was probably the hosting service. It was probably SVN. SVN. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. There we go. There we go. I've been I've been through all, and I mean all of the change control <laughs> systems. It's been really crazy since they've been around so long. Oh, and I think it was right. also Esol that even before the show saw your coding guidelines, and they talked about Perl. Is this thing in Perl? It is. Yay! Yay! Yes. But, Back when Pearl ruled the world. Hooray, hooray. <laughs> you know, it's funny because when I was reviewing the Evergreen uh, stuff, they also said theirs was in Pearl as well. Is it, is it, do are all ILSs written in Pearl? I, I, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I guess the, the, op the open ones are. Okay, yeah, right. Uh, you know, I'm always amazed because th th these are probably mostly legacy systems anyway. They're probably all created about the same time that we started all he seeing the same need and had the open source technologies to be able to do that. And, of course, Perl ruled the world back in the late 90s, so um, right. it sounds like the right time to have done all that. Plus, Perl provided all those, the neat web interfaces and CGI and all that wonderful stuff, some of the stuff which I still deploy green today, you know, although I'm looking more at single-page applications these days. Um, so... So you described the size of the community. Um, and actually, before I go on to that, uh, I think Esol also asked, um, can we, can we, are you familiar with Evergreen? Can we compare this to the features Evergreen has? We're, we're, we're very uh, familiar with Evergreen. Um, and, and so, yeah, there, there's, there's pros and cons to every system. And uh, both are... Um, more collaborative uh like we, we we both share the same um sip module it's not for phones it's something that libraries use that's used for authentication and also um self-checkouts like if you if you go to a library they have the self-checkout machines mm -hmm. uh the protocol for there the the same library is used in both systems for that um that's like a, a, a similar between the two um mm -hmm. Ever, Evergreen and Koha are both open source projects of traditional ILSs, and it's not um, – so the features are very similar. It's just that maybe the buttons would be in different spots, if that makes sense. Um, okay. 
Evergreen uses a client model. Um, so there's a client that you have to download and install um, on your computer, and Koha is all web services based. Um, and for features, they're you know they're, they're both pretty similar. Um, in, in features, it's just kind of which flavor you like more, which uh, look and feel you you like a little bit more. Koha is much better on um, internationalization. Uh, so it's translated in like eighty five different languages around the world. Um, Evergreen doesn't have as broad of a of a, an approach. Uh, one thing, for example, uh, that Koha does really well is since it is such an international project, there are different rules in libraries around the world. Uh, so, for example, in the, in the U.S., probably everyone's familiar with this, is if your book is overdue, usually you're charged fines um, for the number of days that the, that the book is overdue. Mm -hmm. Whereas in France, they have a different model. And their model is the number of days that your book is overdue, uh, you are suspended from using the library for that number of days. Hmm. It's a really interesting so, uh, strategy. Yeah. I Continue. love that. I, I think I wish that the U.S. would use that model um, instead of fines. I think fines kind of uh, maybe limit limit some access to the to the library um, for for some uh, lower income pe lower income people. Uh, but the, the, the advantage with Koha is that it's very, uh, forgiven and it's very, very broad, at least in its program and to be able to accept all these different policies from around the world. Uh, and also again, asking you as a, as a library services, um, you know, obviously a library wants to be inclusive, but there are certain laws in certain countries about, uh, minors accessing certain types of materials. Uh, does Koha deal with that at all? Uh, yes, you, you can uh, establish rules based on like a patron category type. Okay, cool, cool. Um, and and again, I'm, I'm looking at okay. If, if I were to look at the roadmap, where would I find the roadmap for Koha? Uh, Nicole maybe has a better answer Nicole? for that. I think it's on the wiki. <laughs> <laughs> um, the answer is there actually isn't one. Um, oh. No official roadmap. Um, it, it's mostly like I said uh, in the logs on the the email list or um, you know following Bugzilla. Um, it's uh, it's different than a lot of other open source projects I've I've learned about in that way. Um, it's very freeing. Um, there is always you know when we're talking about things like Brendan mentioned that we're going to be using Elastic now as the search engine that had a roadmap. You know, we had plans for that kind of large addition to the software. Um, but there is no, you know, next year we're going to add in the ability to, um, you know, I, I can't even come up with anything. But yeah, there, there's no um, list of features that are coming at certain times other than Bugzilla is what I always refer to. Mm, okay. So we've talked a lot about the checkout process because that's obviously an important aspect of libraries, but libraries these days do a lot more like computer access, um, children's programs, teen programs, things like that. Is there anything built into the ILS to support those functions of the library? Not yet. Um, that's a big one that a lot of people do ask for, um, you know, the ability to manage their programs in there. Um, we were talking with a library about how we could integrate their calendar into the search results. Um, and, and the dev team uh, by order seemed uh, pretty excited about that. Um, so we're sort of talking about that with one of our, our library partners. Um, we also know of, you know, many room um, booking open source applications out there. So we're looking at a few of those to see if we can integrate those into Koha or come up with a, a connector of some sort there so that people can do that. Because we do have um, in um, Omaha, there is Do Space, which is a non-traditional library where um, they have uh, only computers, 3D printers, um, a lot of interactive devices. And so uh, um, booking rooms and booking hardware is a big thing for them. And so we've, we've been talking to them about ways we can integrate that into Koha for them. Yeah, and we've mentioned a lot on here about other open source programs. You just mentioned potentially, you know, using booking, either building it in or, you know, somehow putting them together. I was just wondering, um, you know, it seems to me, but it may not seem to a lot of people that 
open source and libraries sort of go hand in hand, you know, like the, the free access part of the library um, was always very important to me. So I guess if both of you could just speak a little bit about that, just because um, I think it may be something that we're making some assumptions about, but we should probably verbalize. You know, um, I, uh, I I wrote uh, practical open source software for libraries um, many years ago now. I think we're at six years. Um, and um, that was like the key throughout the entire uh, book. And it's also the key through all of my presentations. It makes perfect sense for libraries to use and participate in open source software because of all the reasons you just listed. Um, however, what we're seeing is a bit of a slow uptake. Um, at the American Library Association conference uh, last month, there was a lot of talk about open, and that was new um, in general you, to hear so much talk about open because we have lived in such, when it comes to software, such a proprietary world for so long. And so there's a lot of barriers that we're trying to break down and a lot of uh, misconceptions and FUD that we're fighting through to to show folks that open source for, you know, all their software makes sense. And there are some libraries that get it. Um, there's some really awesome libraries out there using, you know, lots and lots of open source. And then there are others that, you know, just too scared of the, the change uh, to make that leap. But I think after years of education um, on my part and other open source uh, you know, uh, evangelists out there, we were finally getting to the point where I think libraries are starting to, to catch on. Uh, that's, that's interesting. Um, and maybe it's just because, you know, I was in academia. So like academia and sort of open access sort of go together um, because I always... I, I, I'm just surprised that you have to fight the fight, but I'm glad you're out there fighting the good fight. Um, and Brendan, I guess I, I sort of interrupted before you got a chance to answer. No, no, excellent, excellent point and excellent, excellent question. Um, uh, by the way, uh, so for, for me, um, you know, I, I think of Carnegie and creating free libraries, um, and libraries should be free. That it just goes hand in hand that your software should be free too, um, and. and just the whole idea, exactly what you said, for the for academia, uh, you are sitting on such uh, so much knowledge, um, and it, it should be free. And then for you to be able to access that data and have complete control over that, and and, and choice about what you want to uh, share freely, it just goes hand in hand with what librarians do. Uh, and then to just bring it one uh, step further, the reason I think Koha does so well is because it's designed by librarians. Um, the choices of, of, of what goes into it is, is, is it's all library, user library, uh, librarian driven. Well, saying that, is there some way that I, who's only been into a library as recently as 15, 20 years ago, um, <laughs> would I still be able to help with the project? What kinds of people are you looking for to move things forward? Any, any and all people. Um, so there, there's, uh, there's lots of things that, that you can do. Now, it, it's we're getting into interesting stuff because uh, – the whole digital model of uh, people getting into ebooks or e audio or anything like that now. Um, and I think that any pressure that's brought to a library to be able to access those that are uh, free. Um, and also, Nicole talked a little bit about the, the, the makerspace. Um, I think that part of going into a, a makerspace, you could look at it, you could also provide digital publishing. Um, and I think that anyone that wanted to do publishing, they should uh, go to their library um, and, and encourage the library to, to offer some kind of platform for um, uh, people to be able to be able to submit that, be able to have a place to publish um, and, and connection uh, w connecting that free data into a free system. I, it's just, it, it, it matches for, for what what a librarian should be doing. Awesome, awesome. I'd, and uh, I'd add, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. I'd add that, you know, other ways that, that, that folks can contribute is, um, you know, one of the things we hear about from all open source communities, we'd love some, you know, more people who know design aspects um, participating. We have 
Owen Leonard, who is awesome, and he is our our you know uh, gooey guru. Um, but you know we would you know more people that can help him in that area. And then documentation. I am the the sole documentation manager at this moment. So um, anybody who like pops into the software and and you know uses a piece of it and thinks, hey, this this documentation could be improved. It'd be great to start seeing more patches coming in from that way. So there, there's lots of ways that people who are not actually in the library or working in a library can participate and uh, improve the product. And just as an aside, I'm told by the powers that be here that uh, there was a segment on Makerspace on Screensavers, a fellow Twitch show, on the last Saturday, and apparently they made the point that they are the modern public library, so definitely that's a great idea and sounds like it's being propagated quite a bit. Uh, before we get too far along in the show, because we are starting to run out of time, um, what's the licensing for this? Is this like uh, MIT or GPL2 or something? It's a GPL three, I think, or GPL two plus. Um, I can get that for you. One sec. Uh, it, it's that's fine. It's something. It's something GPL. Is, uh, and do you need to sign a contributor agreement uh, when you contribute, or do you still retain your own copyright? Um, there's you no can, agreement. Yeah, there's no uh, agreement. So it doesn't mean there's any way that you could globally change the license to something even smarter or something. Uh, but uh, yeah, so if there's there's no uh, if there's no assignment, then that definitely locks everything in. I know that when I contributed to uh, GNU Emacs, uh, I, I had to do a copyright assignment. So a little bit of my code and every copy of Emacs that goes out the door, it's pretty cool. <laughs> um, and how is this? This is a lot of labor, tons and tons of labor. Is this all just a labor of love for everyone, or is there some funding model for this? So uh, currently, how it how it works is uh, it's all volunteer. Um, now there are companies that provide support services um, on this. There's I, I believe maybe around seventeen or twenty or something like that around the world who are using a support and hosting an installation and like development contract uh, model. Um, now they um, are all submitting code that customers are asking them to write or librarians are asking them to write. Uh, yep. They submit that. Um, but mainly um, there are uh, positions within the, uh, within the community. There's some QA um, people that are part of a QA, QA committee. Uh, there's the release manager. Um, there's the docu documentation manager. Um, now I'd say for Nicole, um, a, a we work together at Bywater Solutions, and part of uh, part of her job is to do the documentation. But she also spends a lot of her own time, uh, volunteer time, on that. I'm the release manager. I, I I do a little bit of that during work, but I also do a lot of it after hours. Uh, so volunteer time. Um, the mm -hmm. QA manager does it all after her work. Um, so uh, I, I'd say that a majority of all of the work that's done per release is, is done by volunteers. Now we just started, uh, a, a funding committee, uh, and there's kind of two sides to it. There's, uh, a committee that is challenged with raising money for the project. And then there's also the committee that decides on how to spend the money that we've made. So, um, currently we have not had a lot of, uh, fundraising. Um, th there's only been that company model where a company has somebody that they pay to work for them and they contribute to the community. Um, I, I think that the goal of this funding committee is as we raise money, then we should, uh, that, that funding committee should start paying people to do these roles in the community full time. Uh, so we should have a funded release manager. We should have a funded QA person, uh, a funded documentation manager, uh, et cetera. And then also, um, do some of the developments uh, that uh, pay people to do developments that sometimes are hard to get uh, libraries to fund. Uh, for example, mm -hmm. um, a lot of the public libraries that we work with, uh, we support over a thousand libraries in the U.S. And uh, they usually, for their funding organization, like a town council or something like that, they usually have to have something that they come back and show to the council as a new feature added. Uh, and there are some plumbing needs that, that need to happen, you know, update of, of code, um, changing of some variables, uh, you know, adding um, 
uh, fast CGI, et cetera, et cetera. And those are harder to get funded um, from a, a library standpoint. And I think that the the, the international fund should definitely um, be funded in that kind of development. How, how easy is this to use for someone who's um, maybe has their master's in library and then um, hasn't worked with an ILS before, or is that even possible? So, so from, um, we actually started a – oh, sorry, Brendan. Go ahead, Nicole. Um, we started a program um, at Bywater actually called Koha Classmates K, uh, Class with a K um, where we're actually offering free installs of Koha to library school classrooms so that um, library and information science professors can teach on Koha so that when these students go into the libraries, they are familiar with it and what an ILS looks like and how to use it. So um, we have about 20 library schools using it so far. So that's a start. Um, but most of our education in our, our library um, degree does not include at using the actual software. And so um, as long as you have a basic understanding of how web interfaces work, it's pretty easy to pick up as long as you also know the jargon, um, which you should from library school. Um, you know, I, I sat down to teach myself Koha from scratch and now I write the manual. So it's, it is doable, but, um, we are trying to fix that barrier to entry by showing, uh, Koha in the classroom now. Okay. Hey, uh, we're almost out of time, as I said again, and I do want to make sure that we've covered everything that you considered essential. Is there anything we didn't ask that you want to make sure our audience is aware of? Both of you. The one thing that I would want to add is that um, it's a great community. Um, this open source project is, uh, you know, I've developed some of uh, what I would consider my closest friends um, through this, and uh, that the community is the power behind the software. That's the people. Um, and that if anyone wants to join in the IRC meetings to see how we're doing, um, there's some fabulous open source minds that are, that are involved with this project. And I, I would just love to see, uh, more people talk about it and, uh, and, and, and really celebrate some of these unsung heroes that are in our community. Anything for you, Nicole? Second that. Yeah, I second that. Um, this community is is amazing, um, and uh, you know, I, I I always feel sad when I go to talks at open source conferences with people complaining about you know troubles within their community because I just we really haven't had that amongst the members of our community. So if you're looking for a very welcoming and friendly community, uh, come on and join us. <laughs> Cool, cool. Uh, those are that's great follow-ups there. Uh, I do have two questions I must ask both of you because it's a required. I think I already know the answer to one of them, though. Uh, what? Uh, we'll start with you, Brendan. Uh, what's your favorite scripting language? Perl. Yay! Yay! Finally, finally. I knew that was going to be the right answer. Uh, <laughs> and what's your favorite text editor? Uh, Vim. Ah, well, okay, one out of two isn't bad. Uh, same two questions, Nicole. <laughs> I'm going to say uh, PHP and Vim. Oh, okay. I, I, that makes sense, I guess. But uh, it's really nice, again, like I said, to hear that the big project is Pearl. Uh, we, uh, yeah, we're out of time, so I just want to say thank you to both of you, Bryn and Gallagher Hangard. And uh, Nicole, actually, I think I'm going to be seeing you on a future show. We, we'll discuss that offline, okay? Great. Sounds awesome. All right, all right. That was uh, that was Brendan Gallagher and Nicole Ingard talking about Koha, not Koho. What do you think, uh, there, uh, Douglas? Really interesting project. I mean, the whole thing with open source communities doing different projects, but um, keeping things separate, like with the Evergreen, it's always interesting. You know, there's always that debate about whether or not that places should combine forces and have an even better product. But it really seems like in this case, I mean. People are really downloading and using the project, and um, there doesn't seem to be a lot of need for, I mean, it can always be better, but um, they seem to be doing quite well. Yeah, I mean, and it's really wonderful to, to, to realize that you don't need a bunch of closed source to do this kind of fairly intense, uh, you know, management of resources and, and uh, cataloging and, and searching and everything else like that. I mean, I'm glad they're using Elastic now to uh, be able to do probably even better searches. Oh, yeah. Isn't that what... Didn't ask what database back in they're using, though, but uh, that's okay. They're gone. Um, 
Okay, so uh, let's look at what's coming up. We've got Karina next week, which is an easy-to-use, instant-on, native container environment from Rackspace. And we have someone from Capital One talking about their foray into the open-source world. So they're actually releasing already uh, an application called Hygea, which is a monitoring dashboard. And that's something almost every big uh, data center needs, you know, those big war, war room screens. So that'll be cool. Uh, but they apparently are going to have like another half dozen that are sort of in the works of being released. And this is stuff that Capital One has been using there. Uh, we have uh, the Cluster HQ projects. Those are things like Flocker, Devol, Elliot, Machinist, and PowerStrip, of which I know nothing about any of those. Some of you may recognize some of those names, though. But we'll have some people on who can help me get information about all that. Uh, there's also a Linux Presentation Day. That's uh, apparently a European event that on the same day in all sorts of countries all over the, uh, the European Union and, uh, and also England. <laughs> since they're now working their way out. Uh, and uh, so I'm hoping to get a very special co-host back for that. Uh, we're working on it, and uh, he's almost given his approval. Uh, then Lucidworks had to uh, cancel and reschedule, but they're still in the schedule again. Uh, that's all about searching your data, finding your data in appropriate places. Uh, we've scheduled Nobody News since last week's show, but I tell you, we've got a whole bunch of people in the queue, mostly the ones I got at Red Hat Summit. Uh, I was there for a couple of days in uh, San Francisco, Go. The weather was temperate. Was was uh, the weather was uh, pleasant, unlike other cities that I've been recently. Um, and uh, from that, I've, we're going to get back uh, Ansible. We had them on many many years ago, but they've really changed a lot of stuff in it. Overt, same thing. Uh, again, many years ago, we had them on. Uh, Manage IQ. Don't quite remember what that was. Um, we're going to bring back my very first guest that I ever lined up for Floss Weekly, and that's Josh Burkus, who talked to us about Postgres. Well, he's now working at Red Hat on their Atomic project. So we'll get him on to talk about what that's all about. OpenShift Origin and Gluster. So if you recognize some of those names, that's great. We'll be having them on the show very soon. As soon as I have open slots again. We are starting to open up Q4 because Q3 is almost full. We do a live stream when we tape this show. Uh, it's at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time. On days at live at twit.tv. Uh, and uh, thanks to Esol and uh, Jay Bennett for their, uh, and others probably, I'm probably leaving somebody out, for their questions today. Uh, you can follow us at Floss Weekly on Google Plus and on at Floss Weekly on Twitter, the, the uh, Twitter one is just actually a mirror of the one on Google Plus. You can follow me as Randall L. Schwartz on Google Plus and as Merlin, M E R L Y N, on Twitter. A rare occasional original content on Twitter, mostly it's Google Plus. Uh, yeah. I was at Red Hat's Bunch of Names. I was at Texas Linux Fest where I actually met Nicole, one of our guests. That was really great. Uh, I will not be slay. Uh, actually, I think it's already passed, but I'm definitely was a little afraid of the Zika virus. I'm not going down there. I will be in Hotlanta on uh, Liberty Weekend for Dragon Con uh, on the EFF track, about five panels. And uh, I'm still waiting to hear back if I'm getting on any of the podcasting panels. So that is everything I have to plug. Uh, um, uh, uh, Douglas, do you have anything you want, you want to plug? I'm going to be at a Mini Demo 23 on Thursday, so that's uh, Mini for Minneapolis. And it's basically, uh, I mean, they do demos, that's in the name, but it's it's sort of the long-term standing of their bar camp thing here. And so I'm new to the city, so uh, I will be going there and trying to meet as many people as I possibly can. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. Well, you did a great job as your first day on the show. In fact, I like that one of the guests gave you an excellent question. So you, that's the badge of honor, and uh, I guess that means you pass all the tests. So you'll be back sometime soon. We'll talk offline about when you schedule you, okay? Sounds great. All right, and thank you for co-hosting today's show, and thank you all in the audience for watching or listening as appropriate, because we'll see you all again next week on Floss Weekly. Floss Weekly.